All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Anna Norton from Diabetes Sisters, and I'd like to welcome you to our next installment of our Life Class webinar series, Diabetes, Menopause, and Hormones. Um, I am the CEO of Diabetes Sisters. I know many of you that have registered today on our online. I will also be moderating today's webinar. I just want to point out that if you have any questions for Dr. Seibel, please use the question panel um, when you register, when you opened up the um, the webinar, and we will do our best to answer all of the questions. Um, if we don't get to your questions today, we can forward the questions to Dr. Seibel, and he will answer them um, in time. Okay, um, so we'll get started. Um, as women that live with diabetes, we find ourselves that experiencing the many stages of womanhood. The last one in the cycle, menopause, is usually the one that's most neglected. And so I would love to welcome Dr. Mesh Seibel, whose mission is to help women become the conductor of their family's health and harmony to create a healthier world. He has served as a professor and the director of menopause and mental health program at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Before this, he was a member of the Harvard Medical School faculty for 19 years, where he served as the director of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Fertility. He's currently serving on the Beth Israel Hospital and Harvard Medical Faculty, so he's back there. And he's also the founder of the My Menopause magazine also writes a weekly blog for Huffington Post on women's health and wellness. His specialties are menopause symptoms, stress, weight control, sleep, and diabetes. Dr. Seibel will be leading today's webinar, and I'd love to welcome him back um, after a couple of years hiatus of Diabetes Sisters. So welcome, Dr. S Dr. Seibel. Anna, thank you so much for having me, and I want to just say what a wonderful job that you do with Diabetes Sisters and how fortunate the country is to have your unrelenting efforts to educate people with diabetes about the essence of their condition, about the things they can do to stay well, and the problems that they encounter uh, become overcome. So I just want to commend you on that and tell you it's a joy to be with you today. The thing that I feel that is so important, I'm so happy to share this with the audience of Diabetes Sisters, is that menopause is a very common thing. As a matter of fact, if you live long enough, it's universal. So menopause will happen and diabetes is a very common condition. And many of the symptoms, many of the things that have to do with those two things are very interwoven. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how these two very uh, common conditions interface and the impact they can have on each other and you. Now, let's see if we can get the slides to cooperate. Dr. Siebel, just hit the space bar. Yes, I am, but it isn't. I can close them and open it again and see if that'll do it. Sure, that'll work. Let's see. All right, we'll come back and put it into slideshow. No, I'm, oh, there we go. Okay, so we're going to, this is uh, entitled Five Things Women with Diabetes Should Know About Menopause. And I want to talk to you about these common changes, but first I want to give you a little background about myself because I think it might have some relevance in this uh, situation. Now we're not getting it to go again, my goodness. Dr. Don't you Seibel, hate it? You I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to run the slides from, from my perspective, and then you just let okay. me know what you want me to do. I'll, just, I'll just call out next slide. Thank you. Sure, you're Sometimes welcome. Technology, don't cooperate, as yes. they say. Thank you, everyone. Let's go to the next. <laughs> Thanks everyone for um, 
for um, bearing with us. One second. Okay. So can everyone see that now? I can't see it. Are you on the same slide? Yes, sir. No, let's go to the next one then. Okay. Goodness, I'm not seeing the next slide. I'm only seeing the... Should I close my slide? Yes. Okay. Ah! Now I'm good. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to start off because many times diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, is associated with weight. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But let me begin by saying that I was a very fat kid. And I have a real appreciation for weight because uh, as a child at uh, two and a half years old, that's me on the left there in front of Sears in Roebuck. And I was at my mother's house when I was helping her relocate from the house I grew up in to the house that she ultimately moved to, to the condominium that she moved to. And that's me in front of Sears and Roebuck there. And a photographer came by and took a picture and put it on the front page of the news. And the heading was what's at the top of the page, Mighty Might the fattest kid in the county. I was, at two and a half years old, the fattest kid in the whole dang county. That's in Galveston, Texas. And there was competition there for fat. And many years later, uh, I grew out of that, and I have maintained a normal ideal body weight. That's me on the right again in the upper left of that uh, picture. That's in People Magazine. I was in People Magazine actually for helping a gorilla conceive at the zoo. But I just want to say that the size of your body can change, but I can tell you that I have a great appreciation for the impact of weight on the quality of life and wellness. Next slide, please. I want to talk and spend a little bit of time with you about estrogen and the study called the Women's Health Initiative, or the WHI, as you see in the upper right there. This was a very important study. It came out in 2002. And why was this study so important? It was important because it came out and said that estrogen and hormones for menopause in general caused an increased risk of breast cancer, heart disease, and dementia, and many other things as well. Now, that turns out that that was completely incorrect. But the initial impact was so great that it caused a generation of women to be fearful and confused about hormone therapy and as a result of all of the confusion that was out there, a generation of doctors too, because a report that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine only a short while ago said that the number of women taking hormones today is 80% less than the number of women using hormones in 2002. Fear and confusion kept them away, and doctors' fear and confusion and reluctance to prescribe it. And as a consequence, the doctors are getting 80% less exposure to hormone therapy, and as a result of that, they aren't getting the same level of experience treating women in menopause or using hormones. And I want to tell you very briefly how come they got it so wrong. It's because the women were so commonly on hormone therapy prior to this study that they couldn't find women who weren't taking it. So what happened was they chose women to get the hormones, and in this case it was there, there were two separate studies, but in the one I'm talking about, the one that came out and said it caused all the problems, the women, although they were 
the age range of 50 to 79, 75 percent of the women, three quarters of the women who got hormone therapy were between the ages of 60 and 79 years old, and three quarters of the women who didn't get it, who took the placebo, were between 50 and 59 years old. So we're comparing 50 to 59 year old women not getting a hormone to 60 to 79 year old women getting a hormone. And of course, women who are older have more medical illnesses. And the women in the study were supposed to be well. They were supposed to have no risks. But I told you they had trouble finding those ladies. And it turns out that many women who received the hormones were smokers, they had diabetes, and they had high blood pressure. Many were also overweight. And all of those are risk factors for medical conditions. And so when they compared the two groups, they were comparing apples and oranges. And I will tell you that in 2013, when the studies were compared by age group and put together, matched for age, the differences were basically no difference with or without. As a matter of fact, women who got estrogen only actually had a reduction in a number of diseases, including breast cancer, including heart disease, and including diabetes type 2 diabetes. And I want to say that I've spent a lot of time on this subject, and if you're interested, my book, which is called The Estrogen Window. The Estrogen Window is the window of opportunity in which estrogen can safely be taken. Describes this in immense detail. So if you're interested, the Estrogen Window will tell you about it. Next slide, please. So menopause became something that is very common, but very confusing, and the treatments became clouded entirely. Let's talk about how many women have menopause at any given time and how many there are going to be. Next slide, please. There are, in fact, 6,000 women a day going into menopause. Every day, 6,000 women a day, that's about 2 million women a year. And if you look at the expectation for 2025, there's going to be over a billion women worldwide in menopause. That is a lot of women at that age and their symptoms and their medical treatments and the preventive things that can be done for them is very important, and particularly if those women have uh, the risk of diabetes or they currently have the condition. Next slide, please. Now this is a slide showing the level of obesity and diabetes in the United States between 1994 in yellow on the left and 2014 in red on the, on the right. And basically what it's showing is how many women had a body mass index, a BMI of 30 kilograms or more. And 30 kilograms, if you don't know, the ideal is somewhere between 18 and, and, 20, and uh, 21, 22. Uh, and, and when you get up to 30, you're quite overweight. But if you look at the number of women judged by the number of uh, people, this is men and women, who have obesity in the United States, in the last uh, uh, 20 years, obesity has just become a very common condition. Two-thirds of Americans are overweight. One-third is obese. Now, if you look below at the incidence of diabetes, again, not having uh, you know, the percentage of diabetes on the left, you see that there's really a small percentage of the uh, country is, has diabetes in 1994, but flash forward 20 years, and over 9% of the country 
has diabetes. And these two things go together. And diabetes isn't only about being overweight. But fat cells cause insulin to be uh, work harder, to have to work harder, and it causes insulin resistance. So it's a contributor. It takes more insulin for people who are overweight to get the sugar from their bloodstream into their cells to use for energy. Next slide, please. This is a very interesting slide showing in the blue the amount of toxicity, the kinds of pollutants, the kinds of toxic chemicals in our environment, and the prevalence of diabetes, the red dots. And what you can see is there's a lot of bad things in the environment. Some of them have to do with very common uh, things such as the cosmetics that you use, the lipstick and the other kinds of cosmetics have some of these products in them, but also the phthalates, P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S, that are in plastics and a variety of other things in the environment. So there's also a correlation between toxins and diabetes and how this plays in or maybe it plays in because these toxins can be stored in the fat and as we get fatter we store more toxic materials in our bodies. All of this is connected in some not entirely known but clearly some way. Next slide please. Now women with diabetes as I mentioned there's about 9.7 percent of the US population of women have diabetes and if we look at it by age younger women 18 to 44 there's 1.3 million women of which a half million aren't aware they have it. There are many people walking around with diabetes that don't know about it and that's unfortunate because many times particularly with, well, with type 2 diabetes, sometimes it's easier to reverse that and get rid of it when you have prediabetes and can do lifestyle measures and other things that can reverse it. So it's, everybody needs to be taking uh, some awareness of their hemoglobin A1C level. I'm sure these are terms that are very common to you, this audience, but your blood sugars and everything, your hemoglobin A1C for people, uh, it should be something they know about. Now as we get a little older, in the 45 to 64 range, and this is a very dynamic, very busy time in women's lives. Children are starting to grow up. They're at the peak of their wisdom and vitality, making gains in the workplace and so many things. 2.4 million have diabetes, of which three quarters of a million are unaware of it. And as we hit the age of 65 and older, there's 4 million women with diabetes, 1 million unaware of it. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of women out there that have diabetes. So you have many diabetes sisters, so to speak, in this country and, of course, expandingly in other countries, too. Now, it turns out that it's more common after 45 with diabetes and menopause seem to have a similar time uh, in place. They tend to occur in similar times. And we'll talk about what hormones have to do with that. But both diabetes and menopause do have something to do with hormone deficiency. If you think about it more broadly, diabetes has to do with an insufficient amount of insulin and menopause has to do with a, an insufficient amount of estrogen or estrogen and progesterone. And so hormones play a role and as a result both can be treated with hormones. Now menopause is not a disease, it is a condition, but the symptoms can be treated with hormones. And of course they have many symptoms in common, we'll talk about this in a moment but urinary frequency, feeling sweaty, and many other things. And then the both treatment makes the symptoms better. And in addition to the symptoms, it makes the underlying physiology better so that women are healthier in both. It's important to treat these things. 
And as I mentioned in the last slide, many don't realize that they have it. Next slide, please. Now in the natural menstrual cycle, if, if we just say, for instance, that it's 28 days just to make it a very clean discussion, a simple discussion, the first two weeks is called, is mostly estrogen. The second two weeks called the luteal phase is mostly, is about estrogen and progesterone. The progesterone is in the pink there or whatever color, the salmon color, the estrogen in the sort of blue color. And it's very cyclic and the whole purpose of the menstrual cycle, of course, is to allow the lining of the uterus to prepare to receive a fertilized egg. The egg itself matures, produces the estrogen and the, not the egg, but the cells around the egg and the ovary produce the estrogen and the progesterone, preparing the lining of the uterus, releasing the egg for fertilization. And if it doesn't happen, women have a menstrual cycle. The lining sheds and it starts all over again. And it's a magnificent system like paired figure skaters. They just, the hormones are synchronized to each other. Next slide, please. Now what happens is that as we get into the premenopause, into those years leading up to menopause, in the reproductive years, it's exactly what I talked about, cyclic balance. But when we get into perimenopause, those are the years that lead up. Peri meaning around, like perimeter. There's no longer synchronization. It's no longer, it's asynchronized and it's imbalanced. And so as a result of this hormone imbalance, you get acyclic imbalance, meaning there's no more regularity. The periods are willy-nilly, wacky. You don't know when they're coming and they get further apart and so forth until they stop altogether in a steady state where the estrogen levels are low and progesterone levels are low and FSH levels of different hormones go up. But basically the hormones of estrogen and progesterone go down to baseline levels, next slide please, which are very low and cause the problem. Now one thing I think important for this audience is to know that women who have type 1 diabetes go through puberty later and menopause earlier. There's something about it that causes the ovaries to stop working or producing hormones at an earlier time and to crank up into action in a delayed way. So this is uh, what is typical to be the case. And of course, that means that women in, with type 1 diabetes may have symptoms of menopause at an earlier time. Next slide, please. The common symptoms of menopause, wacky periods. These are a hallmark of it. The periods go from regular and dependable to irregular to infrequent and then finally absent. There's very commonly palpitations of the chest and the heart. The heart just feels like it's racing. Hot flashes are absolutely one of the most common hallmarks. I can tell you that I have a whole mini course on, on uh, hot flashes because they are so common and women are trying to sort out what to do about them. And they're the symptom that comes brings women to the office most commonly because Number one, they're uncomfortable. Number two, they're embarrassing. If you're a woman and you're at the head of a, a room and you're give, leading a conference or a business meeting or even if you're in the PTA and you're just standing there with the groups or the teachers and suddenly you just start sweating and you start, your face turns blotchy and red and your chest and so forth, it's embarrassing for women and this causes uh, a lot of coming in to be treated. There's a lot of dryness. The eyes get dry, the skin gets dry, and it's like the Sahara down there. It can be quite parched. And as a result of no estrogen, intimacy can become a problem, and even chafing and the lips of the vaginal tissue and the labia coming together can cause discomfort with activity like riding a bike or other things. The loss of estrogen also causes loss of bone 
and calcium comes out of the bone, and especially in the years around menopause. And so osteoporosis or thinning of the bones happens, and the women are go to a higher risk of fracture. Next slide, please. So symptoms of menopause and diabetes. And I think this is kind of interesting. I mean, perhaps um, you've had this. You've had times when your mood is just going up and down like a roller coaster. One day you're happy, next day you're sad. One minute you're happy, the next minute you just feel just moody and upset. Sensitivity with the bladder. I mean, when you have a abnormal blood sugars, you you know you get foggy. When you have diabetes, you get brain fog and uh, mood changes. With diabetes, one of the common symptoms is that you go to the bathroom with frequency. You go urinate a lot, and the sensitivity to the bladder is very common in menopause. Getting an abnormal blood sugar can make you so tired, you're exhausted, and so can menopause because you're not sleeping as well and for a variety of reasons. And then there's just the uh, not interested in sex because there can be a whole lack of desire that's associated with diabetes. Next slide, please. Now, estrogen does play a role in all of this. They're, these are the steroid chemical structures of estrogen, the most common one that women will know and use if they decide to use estrogen in their menopausal years will be estradiol, the middle one that's there. But it's just to let you know that hormones do play a role in your weight. One of the ways it does it is that estrogen is very good about keeping the weight where it's at, and the lack of estrogen causes migration of fat cells from your hips to your belly, and a lot of women will complain of jelly belly or belly fat, and estrogen plays a role in this redistribution of where fat lives on your body. Next slide, please. Now, estrogen also has a role with insulin because estrogen actually increases insulin sensitivity. What does that mean? It means that if your hormones are, if you are, have adequate estrogen levels, that insulin will be able to take more sugar from your diet, from your intestinal tract, and from your bloodstream and deposit the glucose into your cells for energy. And when you get too much sugar and too little estrogen, then it's a fine balance and more of it will go to your belly fat and deposit itself there. Estrogen also slows glucose production from the liver in type 2 diabetes. So it means you're going to be making less sugar production from food. And HRT stands for hormone replacement therapy. Estrogen and progesterone together lowers body fat mass, much for the reasons I just told you, and it also reduces hyperandrogenicity, which means too much of the, quote, male hormone action. So it also improves the insulin sensitivity on muscles. So what happens is with estrogen, you also take more of the sugar, the glucose you eat or produce, and put it into your muscles to burn for energy to fuel your muscles so you're, you're burning up more. Next slide, please. Now, a little bit matters, and I think this is important because if you choose to take estrogen, then be aware that transdermal means you're taking it through the skin, and that typically means a patch, but it could be a gel, or it could be a spray, or it could be uh, the cream, but taking it through the skin increases insulin sensitivity, and if you're going to take it orally, then lower dose oral helps to increase insulin sensitivity, but when you have higher dosages, in other words, the upper range of what's the typical dosing of estrogen, it does the opposite, and progesterone does the opposite as well. Next slide, please. 
Now, what about hormones and hemoglobin A1C? And in a very large study, over 15,000 women with type 2 diabetes, about a quarter were currently using hormones. And in those women, hemoglobin A1C was a half a point lower on estrogen. And about a half a point, 0.5 points lower is equal to a lower 10% in diabetic complications and a 7% reduction in heart attack, myocardial infarction. And here's what's interesting, that same study, the same Women's Health Initiative study that said it caused all these other problems, even when it wasn't matched, the risk of type 2 diabetes was reduced. So hormones are good for lowering the risk or the control of diabetes. Next slide, please. So estrogen receptors located in the hypothalamus, which is the base of the brain, it's the little uh, circle just behind the woman's eye there, uh, serve as a master switch. And it controls food intake and uh, how much energy you put out and body fat distribution. So all I'm going to say with this slide is to say that if those things are working well, then there's less abdominal fat and obesity. So the brain is controlling a lot of this as a result of estrogen's effect on the brain. Next slide, please. Uh, similar studies have been done in mice. You can see there are two mice on the right there. One is thin and one is fat. And basically these rats, they're rats actually, and rats had their ovaries removed by surgery and threw them into menopause. Half got estrogen and half didn't. And the rats who got the estrogen didn't gain weight and the ones that didn't get estrogen gained weight. So all of this has to do with insulin, but also sensitivity to leptin. Leptin is a hormone produced in your stomach, which tells you when you're full. So if you are more sensitive to leptin, your brain is being told by your stomach, hey, you're full, you don't need to eat more. Next slide, please. Now this has to do with pears and apples, and not the fruit kind, but the ones who carry their weight on their hips are pears, and the ones that carry their weight in their bellies are apples. In general, women are more pears and men are more apples, but it isn't always that way. And in a study of women with and without hormone for 12 months, they noted that if women, they, they divided them into apples and pears, Without any change in the weight, the belly fat, which is the fat in the inside around our organs, increased in the ones who didn't get estrogen, but not in the ones who got the hormone therapy. And the apples tended to lose belly fat, if they were an apple, in the HRT group. I'm not going to keep going because time is a matter here. I want to have time to move to the next slide and we'll talk about any of these if you want later. Um, this has more to say about that. I'll just sum it up by saying that people who have lower levels of estrogen store more fat per cell in their belly fat. So this is just all the things and ways that estrogen and insulin and fat work together. Next slide, please. I want to tell you or point and ask you what you know what can you do about it because you've got all of these things. And um, I want to tell you about a magazine. Uh, we used to call it uh, my menopause magazine, but we've changed the name to the Hot Years. And I want to tell you that if you are interested for the Diabetes Sisters, if you go to hotyearsmag.com, hotyearsmag.com, go there. It's a digital magazine. It's an award-winning magazine, and you can subscribe for free and get a opportunity to get this information in your inbox, and it will be helpful to you. We have great articles and information that will be useful to you.
and you're welcome to share this too because I'm trying to get information to as many women as I can. HotYearsMag.com. Next slide, please. Uh, there's a lot you can do by lifestyle. And what I'm just going to sum up very quickly is say that meditation, exercise, these are very important things. Whether you have diabetes or you don't, whether you take hormones or you don't, exercise is good. It lowers your risk of depression, lowers your risk of breast cancer, it lowers your risk of heart disease, and it will control your blood sugar and so forth. Next slide, please. Uh, you don't have to run a marathon. Just begin with walking. Ideally, at 50, 150 minutes a week, that's 30 minutes, five days a week. And I really think if you can get a pedometer, it will help you. Also, another thing that can help you, you can get like uh, MyFitnessPal or some of these apps. I'm sure because of the diabetes connection, you're controlling your calories and you're very mindful of them. But get some exercise that will really be helpful for you. Next slide, please. Um, I'll just say that in, a re in addition to the health benefits, it's going to improve your sleep, improve your mood, and this is independent of diabetes, independent of estrogen, but really, if you can do one thing for yourself, regular exercise. Next slide, please. Uh, it's also going to there are many ways that you can exercise. You know, you, you don't have to go out and do big things. You can just do gardening or dancing or jazzercise or you can do any of the many kinds of exercises there are. Burst exercising is a very good way to be efficient with your time. It's basically high intensity, short duration. So you start off running as fast as you can in place for one minute, just one minute and then resting for two minutes. And then you run in place for one minute and then you rest for two minutes. And you do that for a total of, start with 10 minutes like that and then move it to 15 minutes. And then you start increasing the time, like try it running for two minutes and resting for four minutes and so forth. And you build yourself up. And it's always important to have a medical input at the beginning so that you know you are in good health and don't compromise your health as a result of uh, the exercise being too strenuous. Next slide, please. Um, ideally, you want to get to about 60, 60 to 75 percent of your maximum capacity and a simple way to figure that out is just subtract your age from the number 220 and that's about your maximum heart rate. Just take your age, subtract it from 220 and you know it's not perfect but it's a good way to have a thumbnail sketch of not overexerting yourself. Next slide please. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what to do to lose weight, and there's so many things to talk about here. I could, I have, I'm developing a whole course on weight control right now, but here's what works in terms of losing weight at six months for people. If you look at the bottom, this is looking at a number of women who are overweight and in menopause, and that is don't eat out so much. Restaurants give you too big a portions, too much salt and too much sugar. Eat less fried foods, eat less desserts. You can eat desserts, but you just don't eat all of it and don't get seconds on it. Eat less sugar-sweetened beverages and increase fish consumption, not fried fish, but baked or boiled fish. And these are the things in large studies that really work easily. So these are things you can do. Next slide, please. How are we doing for time? Because I, I, if people have questions, I'll stop and they can just ask questions. Yeah, we're, we're actually a little bit over on time and we do have a couple of questions. Um, what I will say to those that are listening is that these slides will be available tomorrow on our website at diabetesisters.org. Org, so you'll be able to download the slides and go through them again if if you wish. So if and you, I'm happy to answer your questions there too, Anna. You can email me, and I'm happy to do that. And also, each month I have a monthly call. It's askdrmesh.com. A S K D R 
M-A-C-H-E dot com. And uh, the third Thursday of the month in the evenings, it's on my website. It'll give you the call-in information. I'm happy to answer questions there, too. So what I'm going to do, Dr. Seibel, is I'm going to move forward here so that everyone can see how to get in touch with you. They can see how to reach you on social media. And then I'm going to go into the couple of questions that we have um, so that you can answer them. The first one is, and this goes back a couple of slides, um, when you were talking about um, hormone therapy, um, the, the question is, um, it says, you mentioned that doctors don't treat much these days with hormone therapy. The person is saying that she hesitates to take hormones because um, it has to be followed by closely monitoring blood sugars. Um, so how do you approach that? Um, you know, taking the hormones and then having these fluctuating blood sugars. Well, I think that the uh, hormone therapy is going to help you know, with the blood sugar because it's going to make the blood sugar be uh, used. You're, you're going to consume more of the sugar that in, in your bloodstream like that. And I don't think it's any real problem at all. You would just keep monitoring your blood sugar similarly. You may find that it's, it's easier to monitor. And uh, I, I don't think you have to worry about it. Now, in my book, The Estrogen Window, I talk about the fact that it's important to start taking hormones in a window of time close to the time of menopause. So if you've been past menopause over 10 years, you need to talk about it more carefully with your doctor. But assuming that the timing is right and you take a low-dose estrogen, transdermal one through the skin, that should have a favorable effect on your sugars and you just monitor your sugars the same way. Perfect. Um, here is another question. Um, while um, a woman is going through menopause um, who also has diabetes, whether it be type 1 or type 2, what is a healthy range for an A1C um, at that point in time? I think that you have to talk with your health care provider about that because it may depend on other health conditions that you have. And some of the different ones, uh, some of the different labs have different values. But you want to try and get your A1C in as close a control as that you can do comfortably and consistently. And, um, but I'm hesitant to give a number because different labs have different values. And, um, but going on in menopause, the, uh, in, the intent would be to control it in the same way that you would have earlier. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are out of time, <laughs> and I appreciate everyone staying on for so long. We did not lose a single um, attendee, so thank you for staying on. Thank you, Dr. Seibel, for um for, for this information. Um, before we sign off, though, I want to thank all of you for registering. We had over 70 women register, and as promised, we have a copy of Dr. Seibel's book, The Estrogen Window. Um, today's winner is Karen Graffio. So congratulations, Karen. We'll be um, sending this book out to you um, in the next couple of days. I hope that everyone learned. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one more. We have one more question, if that's okay. Um, Dr. Seibel sure. just came in and says, um, do women with type 1 diabetes typically go back to their regular weight after menopause? You know, uh, many people claim that they gain weight after menopause, but what happens is it isn't so much menopause, it's aging slows down metabolism. So you lose about 3% per decade. So as a result, it's important that with aging after menopause that you adjust your calories and it's important that that gets coordinated with your exercise schedule so that you can optimize the, you know, the consumption of calories and maximize the consistency of your weight. But, you know, it's normal to, what happens is a lot of times there's a spread of the way we, we have the same weight, but, you know, our waist gets a little higher because of redistribution of fat and so forth. So it's hard to maintain a premenopausal shape in menopause, but 
uh, with with the diet following your keeping your blood sugars in control and with a healthy diet and exercise, it should be possible to maintain a very lovely body habitus uh, as you age without you know with with that kind of ongoing effort. Perfect. Thank you. And we just had a comment as you were saying that it was the same com the same comment. Remember, we just re we redistribute our weight to our abdomen after menopause. So the, the shape changes. So thank you. And I'm, I'm glad that um, that our attendees are, are knowledgeable in this area as well. But um, as I was saying, and I was thanking everyone for coming, um, I was congratulating Karen for winning the estrogen window, which we'll be sending out this week. Um, I wanted to remind everyone of our next webinar. We will be discussing physical fitness next month on Wednesday, April 19th at 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. The lead of that webinar is Christelle Oram, who also writes a blog at um, online, and we have that information on our website. It's open for registration already. And um, that's it. Thank you all. Happy spring. Enjoy your day. Um, and we will see you next month. Thank you so much, Dr. Seibel. Thank you, Anna, and all of you for joining.